Greetings to you guys in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So we're looking at the fourth installment this evening of the series of the five courses of Israel's punishment. We've looked at the three early ones. Now we're looking at the fourth. Primarily we're going to be looking at the sword and what that means for Israel then and what it will mean for the Israel during the time of the tribulation. And the application for the Christian is what does the sword mean to us in our daily living as we go about being instruments for our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So this passage is from Leviticus chapter 26, verses 23 to 26. And leading on from the third, God says to Israel, He says, and if you will be not reformed by these things, in other words, if you're still not going to be changed, by the first punishment, the second punishment, the third punishment. And he says, and if you continue to walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you. And I will bring seven times more punishment upon you. So we looked at the second one, it was seven times more punishment. The third one, it was going to be seven times more plagues. And now with the fourth one, again, he mentions the third time in this passage of Scripture, seven. And we know that the period of tribulation for the Jews is seven years, the week of Jacob's trouble. So again, there is this correlation with the number seven and punishment, punishment, plagues, punishment. And he says, and I'll send pestilence upon you further on, that your enemy shall come against you. He speaks about the quarrel of the covenant. It's got to do with the land covenant. Just interesting. But on, I think it was on Friday, Turkish President Erdogan put a claim that Jerusalem belongs to Turkey. That was in the Jerusalem Post. So, we know from history that Turkey underneath the Ottoman Empire ruled Jerusalem from 1517 to 1917 400 years and then we know that during passive resistance General Allenby came in there, he rode in on the horse and before he got to the Jaffa Gate he actually got off it because he didn't want to uh, blaspheme against the scriptures because the scriptures tell us in Revelation 19 that the Lord will come in on his white horse. Nevertheless, so for 400 years it was under Ottoman rule and this week literally the Turkish president has declared that Jerusalem belongs to Turkey. At the same time, just northeast of Turkey, Armenia is in warfare with Azerbaijan and Armenia is interesting because when the Turks retreated in 1917 they retreated north of Israel and then passed through Armenia and they by ethnic cleansing by count they actually killed over a million Armenians and if you go into Jerusalem the old city today the, the one quarter is called the Armenian quarter that's where the gate, the Zion gate is, Mount Zion. And in Psalm 132 verse 13, Jesus, well, God says that He will um, preserve Mount Zion and He will keep it for a place where His name shall habitat, for the habitation of His name. Psalm 132 verse 13. So Jerusalem is coming to the spotlight. We know it's the new capital of Israel with what Donald Trump did in uh, 2017. He declared it the new capital. And we can see how they are, are coming for this holy city. It's because God's name is there that the Satan wants to destroy it. But will it be destroyed? What do the scriptures say? Well, I can tell you that it's not going to be destroyed. Between now and the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jerusalem shall stand. 
We know Damascus will be destroyed. Isaiah chapter 17 tells us about the ruin of Damascus, for instance, in Syria. But um, Jerusalem shall stand. It's been destroyed 27 times in total. Just of interest, the first time it was destroyed was, um, well not destroyed, was when David took it from the Jebusites. When it went under, under battle. The tenth time was when the Babylonians came and they, under Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed the temple. The twentieth time, it was destroyed by the Romans, by Emperor Titus, the twentieth time. I'll come back to that in a moment. And through, the, through history, since AD 70 to present, and it's been destroyed another seven times. So in total, Jerusalem is being destroyed 27 times. But the sword is coming to Israel, but Jerusalem will be spared of being destroyed, a destruction. Now with regards to the Roman of interest, if somebody celebrates a birthday for entrance, they will say, after they've sang the happy birthday song, which is the most sung song in the world according to Google, they will then repeat after that song, they'll say, hip, hip, hooray. And they'll generally record that three times. Hip, hip, hooray. So, where, what is the origin of hip, hip, hooray? Hip, hip, hooray. So, my family, we don't sing hip, hip, hooray after our daughter's birthday or after any of our birthdays. So we may sing the happy birthday if there's people around, but generally we don't say hip hip hooray by rule because hip hip hooray is an acronym and the hip is Latin for Heros Lima, um, which is Jerusalem, est perdita, which means Jerusalem is destroyed. So when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70 and the temple, while they were pillaging and burning with fire and plundering it, they were singing and shouting, hip hip hooray. Jerusalem is the Jerusalem is destroyed. So that's why we don't sing Jerusalem is destroyed after one of our birthdays. Um, so with regards to the sword, because Jerusalem was destroyed at least 20 times by AD 70. There are many accounts of the sword coming to Israel and to, the, to Jerusalem, for instance, and to the Jews. So the rabbis looking at Leviticus chapter 26 can see how the punishment of Israel has been fulfilled at one time or another. When the Assyrians came, they would have bought sword. When the Babylonians came, they would have bought sword. The Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, they all report saw. All five of those enemies that came upon Israel at one stage or another would have brought a sword with them. But with regards to the time with the sword, there's a story with King David, for instance. And King David fought against Goliath. And as we know, he put a pebble in his sling. He had five and... It, the first one went through the chink of the armor of Goliath and it hit him on his temple and he fell down and he died. And um, for 40 days, Goliath toyed with the Israelites and there was nobody found that could take out Goliath until David, anointed of the Lord, stood up and said, I'll be that man because the Lord was with me when I defeated the lion and when I defeated the bear and I know he'll be with me, amen, when I defeat Goliath. So... What's interesting is after he killed Goliath, he then took Goliath's own sword and chopped Goliath's head off with his own sword, with Goliath's sword. And with that, the Philistines then scattered and they scurried away from the Israelites. And that happened in the Valley of Elah. And you can read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 17, for instance. Nevertheless, that's a picture of the, of the sword that came upon Israel to annihilate, to decimate Israel. But 
what was meant for bad, God turned around for the good of the Jewish people of Israel. And they succumbed through the victory of David and were able to defeat the Philistines. And we've looked at the various different enemies in the book of Judges, particularly seven of them that come against Israel. With the Christian, he's got the seven deadly sins. Our enemy is sin. But with Israel in the Old Testament, their enemy was natural. Ours is spiritual. Theirs is natural. Ours is spiritual to the point where Paul in Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, We do not fight, fight flesh against blood. So as we can see with Israel here, they fought flesh against blood. Flesh against blood against all their enemies. But with the Christian, it's not flesh against blood. Um, it's against those spiritual entities which I've mentioned before. Nevertheless, so... If you wanted to defeat the enemy with the sword, now the Bible tells us that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So with the Christian, for instance, there's Psalm 149 verse 6 says, Let the hard praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. And there's a song that goes on and says, And we're going to march right up, on the victory side, right into Canaan land. And so, with the word of the Lord, we're going into the promised land. We're going into Canaan land. What Israel did practically, coming out of Egypt across the Red Sea through the wilderness, into Israel, so we do spiritually. We go into the promised land, our promised heaven spiritually, our heavenly Jerusalem. Um, what happens with the Jews with regards coming out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, into the wilderness, at the time of the Exodus, chapter 12, underneath Moses, that was a dress rehearsal, a word I've used before in this series, for what's going to happen during the time of the tribulation. Because during the time of the tribulation, they're going to be in their land. They're going to be in Jerusalem. But they're going to be driven out by the Antichrist. And they're going to go into the wilderness for a period of time. And then the Lord, for three and a half years, is going to lead them back into the promised land. So, it's going to be a rerun of the Exodus under Moses. They're going to go back into the wilderness, and they're going to come back into the promised land. It happened during the time of Moses. Jesus Christ went into Egypt. We see a lot of the patriarchs went into Egypt. And it's always a picture of coming out of the world, and then going into this promised land, this heavenly Jerusalem that the Lord has in store for us. But what's vital for us to know is that we cannot conquer the enemy without the Lord giving us the anointing. David was the anointed one, the called from God. And he was the one that took out Goliath with his own sword. It tells us about Behemoth. We touched on him on the last time I spoke. Behemoth chapter 40 verse 19. He was the chief of all God's ways. Now we know Lucifer was the chief of all God's ways before he fell. And... Behemoth was the chief of all God's ways, and it tells us there that um, only God is able to defeat Behemoth with a sword. Okay, so in other words, we as human beings cannot fight against Behemoth. Alright, it's an impossibility. It's too big, it's too great for us. Likewise with Leviathan, the two beasts. Likewise with the Antichrist, when the Antichrist comes on the scene. These beasts are too great for us. In our personal capacity. But great is he that is in us and he that is in the world. 1 John 4 verse 4 tells us that we can overcome them by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. And the word of our testimony as I touched on in the last talk is vital and very important. I'll give you an illustration. In Acts chapter 19 with the seven sons of Sceva. They came and they found a man that was demon possessed. And they tried to drive out the spirit. And the spirit said to them. Jesus I've heard about and Paul I know. But who are you guys? So when you come against evil entities, or you come against periods where you need to pray, and you need to intercede, and you need to stand in the gap, who are you? If we take Jesus away from you and Paul, and you just left there on your own, who, who, who are you? Because those seven sons of Sceva, not one of them scared that, that evil entity away, that, that spiritual being away. So who are you in the spirit? Do you have the blood of the lamb? Are you covered in the blood of the lamb? Do you have a word 
of testing, or is your word being, being, being whittled away, that you haven't got a word? Can you stand on the word of God and let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand and go and fight the enemy? Go in like David did, as I mentioned earlier, and reclaim the land that the lion had taken. Retake the land that the bear had taken. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go stand in the gap in the valley of Elah and face Goliath? And say, if God is with us, who can be against us? While he stands there in the valley of Elah, he writes Psalm 23 and he says, Though I walk in the shadow of death, thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, like a true shepherd, comfort me. So when you go through your valleys of darkness, know that if you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have a word of the testimony, your sins are forgiven, you're saved by grace, you're a son and daughter of the Most High God, you can go forth in battle, conquering the enemy. You do not need to fear. But Behemoth needed to be taken out by God. Goliath needed to be taken out by David. Haman, in the book of Esther, he hangs on his own gallows. Goliath, his head's chopped off with his own sword. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, it tells us that when Jesus Christ appears, he will, by the word of his testimony, and the brightness of his own, by his coming, he shall take out the evil one. We have nothing to fear. If we are in God, we have nothing to fear. But Israel, the sword is coming upon Israel. It tells us those that are beheaded for Christ, beheaded with a sword in the book of Revelation. Furthermore, with Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, Saul, who is a type of the Antichrist, then does a run on David to take David out. And David flees into the wilderness, so to speak. And he goes to the city of Nob. And he speaks to the priest there. Now Jesus Christ is our priest. He's our high priest. He's our mediator. That stands before God and ourselves. He's Christ the high priest. And he asked the priest, what do you have for me? Because of Saul being on the run and wanted to take David out. Wanted to annihilate David. Wanted to kill David. And there's two things that he gets from the priest. He receives the hallowed bread. And he receives the sword, which was actually Goliath's sword. He receives the bread and he receives the sword. There's two things that are going to nourish you and keep you and preserve you during these end times. And that is the bread and the sword. The bread is the Word of God. The Word of God is going to sustain you. And the sword is going to sanctify you. And God's going to anoint you and bless you for this time. That as the Antichrist is coming upon Israel, for instance, God takes him into the wilderness. They are going to see, receive the hallowed bread and they are going to receive the sword of the Spirit. Every good Christian out there needs those two things to be nourished in the things of God. He needs the Word of God. He needs the Spirit of God. Those two things. And you can take on the enemy. The Bible tells us, Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the Word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even unto the dividing and sunder of soul and spirit. And joints and marrow, and he's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the word of God is for you. The word of the testimony of God overcomes 
the evil one. If we are in Him, we have nothing to fear. If God be with us, who can be against us? For the Christian, for now, you need the Word of God. You need to be in a place where you can receive the manna from heaven, the Word of God. And you need the Spirit of the Lord. Where, where you at? Are you, if you've got the Spirit of the Lord, are you hearing the Word of the Lord? Are you reading your Bible? Are you fellowshipping? Paul said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, he says, Fellowship all the more as you see the day approaching. As you see these things approaching, we ought to fellowship all the more. But we're locked down one. People are getting used to not fellowshipping. You're perhaps watching sermons on YouTube and Bible teachings like on this one on YouTube, and that's maybe your your, your manner, but the word the, the Bible is telling us you need to fellowship. You need to mix this with what other people are hearing so you can figure out and discern the times in which you live. Who's speaking a word over your life now? Are you in tune with the Spirit of God? That you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. The word sanctifies you. It sanctifies you for the battle. The battle you're fighting for your children. The battle you're fighting for your marriage. The battle you're fighting for your work. The Spirit can anoint you for that time. Bring you into favor. The word of the Lord will nourish you. It will give you the faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. The word will give you the faith to go through the battle. The spirit will give you the power to go in. Let the high praise of God be in your mouth. The high praise of God be in your mouth. The word of God in your mouth. And a two-edged sword in your hand. Quick, powerful, sharper. You can go slaying the enemy. So Saul, the type of the Antichrist, is after David. And David goes to Lot and he gets the hallowed bread and he gets the sword. And he receives his security, knowing that he's now armed. And from then he actually goes into the Philistine camp. You see, if you receive the word of the Lord and you have the Spirit of God, you will not fear the enemy. Go into the enemy camp and claim what is yours. God can take out Behemoth. Job 40 verse 19. He can take out Leviathan. Do not fear those Behemoths in your life and the Leviathans in your life and the Goliaths in your life. God can take them all out. But He wants to bring you into a place where like Joseph in Genesis 50 verse 17 he says, I am in the place of God. Are you in the place of God? For what good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Can you say you're in the place of God? If you're not in the place of God, then you need to ask, where is the word in my life? Where is the spirit in my life? The fourth course of punishment of Israel is the sword coming on upon Israel. If they do not receive the mark of the beast, they get beheaded. If they do not bow to the Antichrist and receive him as Lord, they get beheaded. But those that do not bow, God brings them through the wilderness. A rerun of Exodus into the promised land to his new Jerusalem. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. What is your hope and future? Is your hope and future in God? He has the plans and the purposes for you.
the sword. In closing, it tells us in the beginning, verse 23, it says, God says, All these things that have come upon you, if you still not be reformed, if you still not change and reformed, And if you walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Too many people out there, Christians included, are waiting for God to come to them. The Bible says no. You come to God, and then God will come near to you. James 4, verse 8. If you walk contrary to me, I'll walk contrary to you. If you're going to continue in a life of sin, it's going to bring you the sword and destruction. You're going to have no testimony. The same spirit that was in the man at the time of the sons of Sceva, will oppose you. But if you come to God, if he that comes to God, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Thank you, and God bless you.